know, prehistorians. It's your time. This is about prehistory, okay? Um, I think we did not make that very clear in the title. I apologise for that. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about what we think might help to move things along for us from our perspective. Our perspective is, I think I should explain because it's probably a little bit off piste for most people in this room. Our perspective is one where we started researching into beads and bead making in Turkey in the Near East, both of us as PhD students quite a number of years ago now, um, and have slowly developed our ideas on this as we have tried to deal with the problems that we have come across uh, during the course of our work. So, and we'll now explain to you how we think we might move things along in a field that might have stagnated a little bit. We're talking about beads. It's uh, something that maybe people have not thought about that much. I think we all get quite excited when we're excavating and we find beads. This is true, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody jumps up and down a bit and goes, yay, this is really cool. Look, it's pretty, <laughs> oh, shiny. All, all of that. Then we carefully label them, we put them in a small finds bag, register them as small finds, and I'm afraid in our field, I don't know what you guys are all doing, but they tend to then just get put away and nobody ever looks at them again, which is a sad state of affairs. We have remarkably, um, remarkably little literature in this area, unfortunately. It's a sad thing and we really can't understand why because we think these are actually incredibly interesting and they can say so much to us on so many levels about so many different things. We're just going to say a little bit today. Um, so, uh, saying they're under-theorised, I have here a lovely slide with a collection of beads. They're all made of carnelian. They actually come from, this is a genuine assemblage from a Bronze Age tomb in Turkey. I've just been working on it. I selected it because it was, you know, something current. What I can show you here is, according to my traditional typological approaches, um, I might be looking at saying that perhaps these two are cylinder beads, okay, according to our classic approach. Incidentally, our approach to these things was invented in the 1920s by somebody called Horace Beck. Things have not really moved on since then. This is how stagnated the theory of this field is. Really, really stagnated, okay. So I might call these two cylinder beads. Or I might, in fact, call these two barrel beads, maybe, because it's not clear to me. Or I might, in fact, call these two barrel beads, actually. Or, well, maybe, in fact, these two are more like barrel beads, but they're different sizes. I don't know. I mean, do, do we put those two together? Do we not? It's very difficult to know what to do with this situation. Um, we're kind of stuck with this terminology and an assemblage here of things which are, as far as I'm concerned, none of these are the same and none of them really fit together in any meaningful way whatsoever. And trying to make them do that is a really unhelpful way to approach an archeological assemblage is the conclusion that I've come to. Um, I have some more examples here. This is another aspect of the same problem, which I also think is really worth looking at. These are two beads from two different sites. These are very early, very early Neolithic sites. We're talking eighth millennium, ninth, eighth millennium uh, BC. And these are just two beads. As you can see from these pictures, these beads have changed really radically from their original appearance. The hypothesized original appearance is at the bottom here and the big one on the right. Um, they've changed really radically, obviously. Now, what's happened? They're made of hard materials. They've been worn a lot, really a lot, through time. Um, to wear through stone like that takes some serious amount of use. They've been strung. They've both been broken. The original piercings have been broken. They've been re-pierced. They've been played with. One of them has had lots of scratches and grooves cut into it. Another one has been, as you can see, completely reformatted. The, the way that it was used has been completely changed. So what's happened? Do we look at these in terms of aesthetics? Because it seems to me that the original aesthetic of these objects has been completely lost. They are now something totally different from what they were originally. So what do we do with this? Because my normal traditional typology does not deal with this at all. It's hopeless. There's nothing I can do with it. Okay. So thinking our way through this, we've identified the problems. We're not dealing well with what we've got at the moment. Um, what I think we need to do 
in order to deal with them better, we look at time. The time issue is that people have been using them. So surely we need to look at them as things with the people that use them, as changing objects, and perhaps stop characterising them just as personal ornaments, which is, let's face it, how we all categorise them when we work. The word ornament in itself is probably the most unhelpful thing imaginable in this, uh, in this scenario, because it automatically leads us to assume that they are items of decoration. Whatever we do, you, you come back to that, you know, it's jewellery. And, well, actually, maybe it isn't in the way that we understand that at all. Let's look at it that way. Um, so to say that they're associated with display and grouped by appearance, colour and size seems to be underselling the whole situation quite radically, and which seems to be a thing that's actually crying out for a different approach. So as Emma said, this is something we've been thinking about and talking about together for a number of years. And I went to visit Emma in the spring, uh, about a month or so after Richard, Naomi and I uh, came together to write the first draft of the paper that has spawned this, uh, this session. And whilst we were talking over all of these problems that Emma has with the bead record at the moment, I started saying, well, maybe we have a slightly different way of looking at it. And as we're saying, this is prehistoric, so we don't have any written records to say people thought this way. So we are just using elemental theory in this sense as a lens to just take interpretation slightly further with um, the bead studies. You know, can we go beyond the visual? Can we think about these in a different way, in a way that they may have been conceptualized in the past? So as uh, Naomi has already explained to us, each, everything in life has its own temperament and these temperaments can be transferred to other animals, other beings, other people, other things through all of the five senses. So we've already talked about a lot of the visuals of beads. So potentially when you see beads they have meaning and they have their temperament and that's being transferred. Um, we also potentially, uh, with sound, I don't know if people wear bangles or jewellery and beads, but I play with things. I'm terrible for running things through my fingers. I slip my rings off and on. You know, they make great sounds, these things, and maybe that has meaning as well. Also, touch. They're very tactile things. So just wearing them, just saying they're visual is kind of not enough. And one of the things we were looking at whilst I was doing this, I found a paper on modern Bedouin practices. Now I'm not cherry picking, you know, ethnography, you know, you just pick it up and kind of shove it on the past. It's not what we're doing. We're just using these things as a different way to think, the same as we're using um, elemental theory as a different way to think about these things. But with, these Bedouin, with this Bedouin study that I found, they have a lot of uses of beads. This is all the beads. Please don't concentrate on this too much. It's too small. Don't, don't strain your eyes. I'm going to pick some of these out. These are current uses of what they call ancient beads. So these are beads that have been passed around family groups and within the community. They're mainly held and curated by old, old elderly women within the society. And they are known. The bead, the individual beads are known to do things, to have properties. And if you have a problem, you go and find the old woman who holds this bead and you ask to borrow it. So if you are having problems with lactation, you go and find the woman who has the bead of milk, the coral bead of milk. Coral is a slightly dimpled texture. It's strung on the neck and it hangs between the breasts and it is white. And therefore, you know, it is, it is suggesting that it is going to help you produce this milk by wearing this bead. So that texture is the important thing. It's dimpled like a nipple that's ready to give up milk. We also have taste and potentially smell. This is something I, I was not expecting to find. But another one that we have here again is coral, red coral, anxiety disorders in children. With, these, with this bead, you actually scrape a little bit off into water and the child drinks it and that Im imbues that power into the child. There's another one, Naomi, um, Terry, you'll love this one. You bake it into a chicken, you put a bead <laughs> in a chicken, you bake it in the chicken and then you take the bead out, send it back to its owner because it belongs, you know, it goes back to the old woman and then you eat the chicken. 
and that I can't remember what that one was for. It was a general sickness, wasn't it? That I one. Think so, yeah. so you have to eat what is plain food, but baked with this, this with this bead inside it, and that power is then transferred through the diet. So, so food, even oh gosh, you're not even halfway through. Okay. <laughs> um, so here we have two other beads. This one up here. As you can see, strung on its own, importantly. So, you know, all those restringing in museums where you kind of group all the beads together. Beads have power strong on their own. This one kills boils because it's got that little boil. So using like with like, if you've got a boil, you put something very similar next to it and it, and it helps with the boil. This one down here, it's got almost a snakeskin texture. It's very smooth, like the belly of the snake. And you wear it if you've been bitten by a snake. And it... It doesn't matter where you've been bitten by the snake, you wear the bead where the snake bite is. So you wouldn't necessarily see that. It would be under your clothes, potentially. Okay, so having looked at these, okay, I'm being quick. Um, having looked at these examples of all these different and exciting individual beads that do different things, let's move that back into the archeological record. Because this, as far as I'm concerned, is a more typical example of how beads work uh, in the Neolithic period, for example. This is from Chattel here. What do we have here? We have a string of, okay, we can say they were strung because they were all discovered in that kind of context, but what do we have on the string? All kinds of different things. We have um, dog teeth, we have blue beads, we have different forms, there's a clay bead there. There's all kinds of things. There's a very worn bead as well, very interestingly. What do we have? Not an aesthetic item that we would understand as a normal item of beaded jewellery. It's very different from our modern perception of these things. Now, we might suggest that rather than just interpreting this as a typological set of things, surely, you know, we might look at this and say, well, why were dog teeth chosen? Does this have something to do with what the dog itself was and the properties of the dog? Do we then look at the blue beads? Now, this is another area of research that I'm working on, and I can't go into it all today, but there's pretty good evidence now that the use of blue beads starts in the Neolithic with probably the same implications that it has today. They're used to ward off evil. And it increasingly seems that that started way back in about currently looking at about 6,600 BC, um, that these blue beads come into use and seem to have a meaning. They're very widespread. This is a very well-known example um, from Chattel Hick again. It's a baby with bracelets and anklets on. Now we might look at this and think that's very interesting. Look at those bracelets. Those are what we understand as bracelets, aren't they? Look, all the beads are the same. Brilliant. This is good. It's just what we recognise. But we need to think about actually not that that's a baby with bracelets on, but what is that baby doing there in the grave with those bracelets on? Not all the individuals at Chattel who have any ornaments on them, okay? This baby has a lot. Now, what's that all about? Are they ornaments or do they have a value? We have to consider the idea. We're suggesting that actually they might have been to do with perhaps this child became ill, perhaps the beads were used for a purpose rather than just for decoration. We don't know that. It's also possible that they were put on after death, of course. We can't say this for sure. I'm not trying to oversell the case. But just a step in interpretation. A yes, further a step different in way of looking at it. So this is something that I'm particularly interested in, the use of animals and beads. And this, uh, this um, set of animal bones was found with some uh, shell beads strung across the vertebrae of some sheep. Uh, there's also a couple of other things in there, so it might just be a bit of a special deposit. So there's also the, the skull of a pig and things like that. It may just be a group of things. But also, as it's strung on the neck of the sheep, the excavated ma excavators made this comment that actually within this area of Turkey, people still bead their sheep. Sheep, sorry. <laughs> and, and, and they kind of left it like that, you know. In, at Chatelhoyuk, they may have been beading the sheep. Oh, and we still do that, full stop. What? You can't leave it there, that's crazy. So we still have these, these sheep wandering around with beads, but within this group of 30, there were four sheep that had been chosen to wear beads. What's different about those four sheep? Can they protect the entire flock because they're beaded? Or do those sheep have specific meanings? Um, there's also, within this tradition, other associated goods. So this is a bag of salt hung up with a man who said he was not 
superstitious, did not do magic. His cow did not have a bead on it. No, it was just on the house um, that the cow stayed in. So it was like, oh yeah, but if you don't do it, <laughs> you know, it's your fault if something happens to your cow. So he didn't believe in it, but he did it anyway, just in case. So, you know, and there's salt associated with that. So we need to look at all of these things in context. Yes, associated context, very important. So I think it's quite obvious from well, what we've got in terms of archaeological evidence and ethnographic evidence, not that they're directly related to each other. We really don't want to say that. But there is definitely something to be said for thinking outside of our current interpretive framework, which isn't really doing it for us at all, and trying to find another way of looking at things. Um, we're suggesting we need to look at the individual. So looking at individual beads rather than just a bunch of beads together in a typology. It's not really helping us. Um, and looking at the individual person and the individual time period of each item because those are all different things. They don't equate with each other and we need to understand how they work together. Um, and we obviously, according to that last slide that Holly just showed, we need to think about the context because having a bead with a bag of salt next to it is really different from just having a bead, I think. It doesn't make, look like a decorative object when you have the bag of salt next to it. Even to our modern eyes, it looks like something really different. Um, so we're suggesting overall that really we might want to look at all the hints that we've seen together here and use this as a tool not again not saying this is you know a solution and obviously it's very difficult to work in very deep prehistory which we are but using it as a different way to think about things and to think about all the properties of an object including its feel and its everything else sound and everything even its taste i mean who would ever have thought that for a bead and then thinking beyond the ornamental thank you very much